Dear Professor Popescu, thank you for agreeing to offer us this interview. My first question for you is, um, as a member of the task force for developing the national strategy on cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases, what are the key objectives of the project and how do you envision it will contribute to the improvement of healthcare in Romania? Thank you very much for inviting me. I think that uh, it's really necessary to have such a national program with a complete involvement of the central authorities and with the, with the local authorities actually, and to have some target strategies to improve uh, a health field that is uh, extremely dangerous for our population. Because I say that because actually myocardial infarction and stroke they are the major killers of Romanians. So uh, it, it's extremely important to, to bring this to a level uh, of, uh, you know, health politics, health policies. So it, it's really important to approach this field at a different level. There are different levels. So first of all, I mean, we as doctors would like to prevent unfortunate health events. So this is one very important uh, part, prevention. And uh, just to mention it now, uh, we have very high uh, percentages of population with uh, uh, a really high, uh, uh, let's say, uh, vascular risk factors, meaning that we have a lot of people with hypertension, uh, high blood pressure that are not diagnosed, uh, the same for diabetes, or a lot of diabetics that they do not know that they have this disease, so forth and, and, and so on. And, and not only that, uh, among the people diagnosed already correctly, only part of them, uh, uh, a percentage of them, they are controlled in these very serious diseases. So we really have to improve this, what we call prevention, when we refer to, to crucial events like myocardial infarction or stroke. So this is a, a part that is uh, really important. And this will bring results only after 10 years, 20 years. So, so you know, we have to look at it uh, and invest in that and then to wait to improve things with the correct prevention 10 or 20 years later. But still we have to do it obviously. Then a second part is we as doctors, once we have a lesion in the brain, because I'm a neurologist, well, you want to limit that lesion. To do anything is possible with the treatment in the acute phase uh, to spare the, the brain tissue. So to lose a, a low number of neurons instead of a big number of neurons. And then it comes to the, to the interventions that uh, are important in stroke, such as it is uh, the acute phase intervention for a percentage of patients uh, who are respecting some clinical and uh, imagery criteria, meaning uh, thrombolysis, so to, to give them a substance to solve the clot yeah, that is there. And not only that, sure, there is a large array of treatments that are needed in acute phase low temperature, uh, normalized uh, glycemia, blood, uh, glucose blood level, and so forth and so on. Uh, so this is for the acute phase. And then it comes to the point that you would like, okay, you, you did what you, you did, what you could do for the lesion to be as small as possible. Uh, and then we would like to, to go further on and, and uh, extract the clot from the blood vessel when is possible and when we have indication. And this is called thrombectomy or uh, aspiration of the thrombus. And, and uh, if with the thrombolysis we increased a lot as compared to 10 years ago, now we are just starting to implement this thrombectomy and we developed a program, educational program uh, in the universities and we hope to get specialists in this field because you need human resources in order to cover as much as you can from the from the surface of our country and then after the acute phase you do whatever you can to save 
uh, brain tissue, but then finally you have a lesion and you have a corresponding neurological deficit. I mean, weakness or some part of the patient does not see in one part of the body or, you know, balance problems or uh, speech problems, you have aphasia, what a communication problem, whatever it is. So there is a, a neurological deficit. And now it comes to the point when you have to go further on and, and uh, bring in what is called neurorehabilitation. So then uh, there is a continuum for the patient with stroke that should be addressed in every single part, in every stage of it, by this new program, which, for, which fortunately is, is covered and acknowledged by the Ministry of Health. And I would like to be very thankful to Professor Alexander Rafila, who uh, prioritized this, this uh, very important uh, program. Uh, and moreover, after this, after neuro rehab, we still have other objectives, what is called, for instance, secondary prevention. So one patient with a stroke uh, have the risk and increased risk to develop a second stroke. This will be catastrophic. So this is what can we do to prevent a second, a second stroke. So this is called secondary prevention. So at a glance, I wanted you to illustrate how complex and important and uh, uh, process is that and the, the importance of the program to cover all the stages that I mentioned. Recovery after traumatic brain injury requires a multidisciplinary approach. Can you discuss the importance of pharmacological interventions in supporting neurorehabilitation after TBI, considering the newest developments in the field? Well, traumatic brain injury is, uh, is another important uh, health issue since uh, we don't have, you know, magic solutions for it. And it can come at any age. I mean, the young people, they are, you know, uh, tempted to do risky things like riding a motor bicycle with a very high speed or going for risky sports and, and this kind of stuff. On the, on the other end of the story, you know, old people, for instance, uh, due to many diseases, they have frailty, what is called frailty. They are fragile persons and they can fall and, and secondary to the fall, they can have traumatic brain injury. So, you know, is a, is a, is a problem because, I mean, brain is very sensitive to trauma and uh, actually is, is very complicated disease. It's not only what is uh, lesion per primum, let's say, what is called the primary lesions in the traumatic brain injury. It starts a very complicated, deleterious phenomenon in the brain once one had a trauma, and then this includes secondary lesions at the pathogenic mechanism, and it includes, uh, you know, many things like delayed uh, neuronal death or uh, vascular um, factors with the brain edema, alteration of the blood-brain barrier, so forth and so on. So it's really complicated, and obviously uh, everyone knows that that uh, it is unfortunate enough then our, our brain do not produce new neurons. So we have to uh, guard and save the ones that we are born with. So uh, again, there are many complicated processes. Again, we, are, uh, we have the target to save as much brain as possible. And the question was related to multidisciplinary approach. So yes, it is like that. So formally the patient goes to the neurotraumatology, neurosurgery department. But it's only a part of the possible treatment in some cases, the evacuation of hematomas mainly, that are needed as a neurosurgical maneuver in the case of these patients. Otherwise, uh, first of all, we have to, you know, compensate uh, all uh, changes, abnormal changes in metabolism. We have to treat uh, brain edema. And nowadays, obviously, there are improvements in the pharmacological treatment of TBI. And we know there is a list of drugs, for instance, that we know that should not be given to these patients because they kind of block the reconnective properties of the brain because first traumatic brain injury means deconnection, meaning that our, our brain has neurocircuitry and due to lesions, you know, this circuitry is affected and, and there is 
parts or there are parts of the brain that are deconnected. And then in a second phase, the brain trying to readapt and try to reconnect. So there are drugs that, you know, stop these reconnective properties of the brain. And there are drugs that seem to help to these reconnection uh, um, pr processes. So, so the thing is, to cut a long story short, that obviously you need neurosurgeons, for, that's for sure, but you also need you know, doctors to run the imagery and to see from uh, basic uh, CT scans uh, if there is blood in the brain or not, if the brain was uh, uh, teared away, I mean, dilacerated, uh, but to very sophisticated ones, like functional MRI and to see uh, at, uh, performing a specific task, w what areas are not connected to the areas they should be. And, and neurologists also are important to approach uh, the, these patients with a pharmacological treatment and to try to find solutions for compensating the neurological deficit that are restant in, uh, in such a patient, and obviously these patients are also subject to neurorehabilitation afterwards. Multimodal approaches have shown promise in assessing and treating traumatic brain injuries. Can you elaborate on the benefits of such approaches and how they can improve patient outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I would explain that very simple. Uh, so it's not enough and it was during the time, I mean, there were studies, clinical studies trying to uh, uh, you know, prove simple way of to approach uh, a traumatic brain injury, and all yielded negative results. And that's because it's not enough to block a receptor or you know activate a, a channel in a neuron to to change the situation in such a complex pathogenic situation. What the multimodal means is that simultaneously you act with an intervention that is kind of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, interfering with the pathogenic uh, processes at different levels. And what I think we should do is that uh, first step is to understand how the brain tries to heal itself. Because, I mean, the brain has so-called endogenous defense mechanisms and repair capacities. So one of the facts that are evident there, obvious, from all the studies in research in, in, in clinical neurosciences and basic neurosciences are, for instance, the presence of trophic factors. Now, each time we have a synapse, meaning a connection between neurons, so two neurons communicating, the, the so-called postsynaptic neuron, so the second one, let's say, you know, gives, I mean, uh, gives these molecules of neurotrophic factors to the first one, to the presynaptic neurons. So it's a, it's a manner in which the neurons keep uh, one each other alive. And, and these trophic factors, they act at very different, uh, uh, you know, chains, chains of molecular event, meaning that they counteract, for instance, uh, neuronal death uh, under form basically of apoptosis, and they, they uh, you know, stimulate neuroplasticity, so reconnection of these nerve terminals and, and many other things. So uh, why not you know, try to mimic this that brain itself is doing? And that then we have nowadays good data about such uh, uh, products that are actually mimicking the action of trophic factors in the brain and it's kind of logical uh, to try to do so. Uh, and we have clinical studies showing that is efficient in this way. Uh, and uh, I think there is a future for this multimodal approach. How do events like the EFNR, WFNR, Eastern Europe Regional Meeting in conjunction with the Bistrica Clinical Neuroscience Conference facilitate the exchange of ideas and promote innovation in neuroscience research and practice? Yeah, thank you for the question. The, the main point is that to, to understand if we want to to improve this uh, very large field of neurorehabilitation, neurorecovery, uh, we need education at different levels. So we need education at the patient level just to understand that this is possible if you by uh, accident uh, you know, lost uh, some of your neurons in the brain, you might have the chance to do things in order to gain them back, not the neurons, but the function. 
So that's one thing. I mean, people should be aware of that. And the second part of the education is dedicated to medical staff. So, I mean, doctors, they should be aware of the fact that we, we can uh, improve a lot the functional deficit of our patient regardless of the uh, disease, can be stroke, can be TBI, by using this uh, improving neuro, neuro rehabilitation techniques. So you have to have this education at all levels. So I think this meeting is very important, first of all, for this education process. And we have the chance to have here the WFNR, this World Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation, the EFNR, the European Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation, with very experienced people. So these are probably the best experts in the field. So I think it's a great opportunity that they came to Romania for this regional meeting. We have quite quite a few doctor, Romanian doctors here, neurologists, probably more than 100. So I think it's a great opportunity to understand what we should do with our patients in order that they are better. They follow these stepwise processes in all stages, as I told you, prevention, acute treatment, you know, subacute treatment, then rehabilitation, secondary prevention, so forth and so on. So, so good. All right. Thank you very much for the interview. I do thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you for being here.